today's story, we're gonna learn about an infamous cowboy bank robber who also never had to speak or even use a weapon in order to walk away with a saddlebag full of cash. Today's story is all about the life and death of Cowboy Bob. This is a bank robbery. Give me your money, no marked bills or die packs, the note says. The teller in the Irving, Texas bank looks up to see this old dude in a cowboy hat. He doesn't move or fidget and he doesn't say a word. She hands him a stack of cash. He nods as a sort of, thanks, partner. Slips it in his satchel and walks out of the bank. The cowboy keeps his head down and avoids all the cameras as he walks out, leaving the detectives with no clear view of his face. It's 1991 and as FBI agent slash expert on all things bank robbery, Steve Powell reviews the surveillance tapes and knows he's dealing with a professional. That same year, their cowboy bank robber re-emerges at another bank in Irving and successfully steals $1,258, which today would be around $2,575. This time, when the cowboy con man gets away, someone is able to write down his license plate on the back of his Grand Prix. The police track it to the home of this old lady who's super confused about what they're talking about. They look at the car outside and see that the license plate is missing, and they realize that their mysterious man must have stolen the plate to lead them in the wrong direction. Dang. This guy is good. A month later, Cowboy Bob, as Steve Powell nicknames him, strikes again. This time he hits a bank in Dallas stealing $3,000. A few months later, he hits a fourth bank and steals $5,317. That's over $10,000 today. This time, Cowboy Bob calmly hands back a stack of cash to the teller that he finds containing a hidden die pack that she tried to stick in the middle. By this point, Steve says he's just about ready to pull his hair out. How could this thin, dried up cowboy be whipping us this bad time after time? In September of 1992, Cowboy Bob robs a bank in Mesquite, so the cops fire up the squad cars again and race out there. Their license hit once again is a guy who steps outside to the authorities and is confused about where his plates went. But that day, as they're investigating at the bank, another call comes in. Cowboy Bob has got his biggest pot of beans yet, $13,706. According to the teller who deals with him, he's so stoked about that many beans that he gives her a cute little nod, sort of like a milady. Ugh, we absolutely love a man who commits to the character. Robin Banks is bad, don't get me wrong, but you've gotta admit, Cowboy Bob's got style. Speaking of character, some people report that they think the costume getup is a disguise. Not only does Detective Steve notice when the 10 gallon hat Bob's seen wearing is sometimes backwards in the surveillance tapes, but some tellers say they think the man's beard looks glued on and that his protruding belly looks a little lumpy as if something is stuffed inside. Because of this, it's impossible to tell how old, tall, heavy, or thin this man is or what his face even looks like. When Steve gets the call that Bob is trying to make it a double that day, he hops in his car and flies up the interstate. This time, the license plate on the car is traced to a man named Pete Tallis. The FBI agent rolls up to Pete at his work and asks him if he owns a Grand Prix with the license plate number they caught in security cameras at the bank. And Pete says yes. But he never uses the car, so he lent it to his mother and sister about a year ago because they can't afford one. They tell Pete that the car was just used in a bank robbery and Pete's like, Bull that car can't go fast enough. Pete gives the address of his mom and sister, Helen and Peggy Joe, and the FBI agents race to the woman's apartment complex. As they're driving to the address, they're thinking that Peggy Joe must be the Bonnie to Cowboy Bob's Clyde. Uh, Cowboy Bob's girlfriend's name is Peggy Joe. This is better than a movie. They pull up to the complex and see the Grand Prix in the lot and they're like, oh man, we got him. As they sit there and try to figure out their plan of attack, they consider storming the apartment and catching their riches Robin rascal red-handed. When a middle-aged woman in shorts and a t-shirt comes walking out towards the car, they assume that that must be Bob's girlfriend. They let the girlfriend drive away so that the cowboy Bob wouldn't see them and then they follow her. They catch Peggy Joe around the corner and they ask what she'd been up to that day. She says she went to the local nursery for a bag of fertilizer and they look in the trunk at this big bulky bag and they're like, oh, this is it. But it really is just a bag of fertilizer and they're like, oh. So they ask Peggy Jo if they can have a look inside her apartment and she's confused but says yes. She says they won't find much aside from her old sick mother. Really? What about a cowboy hiding in the closet, Peggy Jo? When tiny, frail Helen opens the door to the FBI agents with their weapons drawn, she screams as they burst past her in the house. They assume their cowboy on the run is hiding somewhere in the apartment after Peggy Jo had paused before saying they would only find her mother. But when they get to Peggy Jo's room and find a bag of cash under her bed and a cowboy hat in her closet with a beard pinned to a styrofoam head, they knew she was Cowboy Bob's accomplice. They're like, Come on, Peggy Jo, the gig is up. You're hiding a man from us. Peggy Jo stares him down and is like, I assure you, there is no man. Wait a second, no freaking way. And that's when agent Steve Powell notices the little bit of glue on Peggy Jo's upper lip with a little bit of hair stuck to it. Their cowboy Bob is none other than Peggy Jo Tallis. What? Yes. 
He pulls out the handcuffs, reads her her rights, and Cowboy Babette is taken downtown. When Steve realizes he is dealing with the case of his career, he does everything he can to get the shy, polite woman to talk. Obviously, he wants to know why she's robbing banks, but Peggy Jo doesn't want to talk. She seems embarrassed to have been caught and doesn't respond to any of Steve's questions. But eventually, she tells a psychologist who interviews her that she decided to first rob a bank to pay for her mother's medication. Peggy Jo says she never had any intention of robbing more banks after the first one, but when he asks her why she does, she says she isn't exactly sure. The psychologist realizes it wasn't about the money, it was the thrill of the chase for her. Steve says if it weren't for the mess up she makes on her fifth robbery where she used her real license plate, he isn't sure they ever would have caught her. And her MO is unlike any Steve has ever seen before. He's so used to these violent men who often burst in yelling, waving their assault weapons, and sprinting for the door that he is fascinated with Peggy. She never carries a weapon, never speaks, never threatens, and never runs. The psychologist says he's interviewed over 50 different male bank robbers in his lifetime, but has never quite met a robber like Peggy Jo. The judge in her sentencing also has no idea what to do with this mild-mannered woman who agrees her behavior is completely out of character for the rest of her seemingly boring, mundane life. He sentences her to 33 months in prison, and while she's in there, a true crime author reaches out to her to get permission to write her story. But it seems like Peggy Jo wanted to put the past behind her and politely declined, saying her family doesn't need any more embarrassment. I love that it was never really for money or attention for her. It was just living out her cowboy robber dreams. After our cowgirl's prison stint is up, she seems eager to move on and rarely talks about the robberies. Her family says she never brings it up and really tries to make amends with them. To avoid the stares from curious neighbors, Helen and Peggy Jo move to a tiny two-bedroom townhome where Peggy cares for her mother, Helen, full-time. It's the mid-90s and Helen's hands have gotten so shaky she can no longer do much of anything. So Peggy Jo cares for her mother all day, gives her a bath at night, and then watches nature documentaries alone in her bedroom. Peggy Jo gets a job as a cashier at the Harbor Bay Marina, and she sells things like fishing bait, little touristy trinkets, and floating keychains. Peggy becomes a star employee at the shop, and her manager prides her in the cash register, never coming up short once on her shift. Peggy Jo even helps out the customers who can't afford things and uses her own money to help them out. Peggy's manager says she took to caring for certain characters who came around, such as a deaf man she would take the time to communicate with in writing, as well as a man who had just gone out of prison that she often gave some of her paycheck to. When her manager would ask her why she did that, she says, well, we all got a past, you know. Okay, this is literally one of the greatest people I've ever heard of. You know, she is one of the closest things to a real life Robin Hood we've ever heard. In 2002, Helen passes in her sleep and Peggy Jo is there holding her hand. She is glad for her mother to not be in pain anymore, but it definitely takes a toll on her and she can't talk about her mother without tears coming up to her eyes. When she meets up with her family at the funeral, who hadn't heard from her in a while, they ask what her plans are now. She says she's got a plan, but doesn't tell them what it is. Oh man. Is our wily western woman about to write again? In the spring of 2004, Peggy buys an RV for $6,000 in cash. She sells everything from her and her mother's home and takes to a life on the road. She spends her days on the marina fishing and bird watching, sitting on a maroon camping chair while drinking Pepsi out of a coffee cup and smoking menthol cigarettes. Absolute icon. That summer, Peggy's good friend Carla gets breast cancer and Peggy Jo checks on her every single day. One day, she leaves Carla a voicemail that says she's going to hit the road and that whatever happens to her, always remember that she loves her. Uh-oh. Peggy Jo, what are you planning? That's a pretty cryptic voicemail, hun. Obviously concerned, Carla and her husband drive out to where Peggy Jo's RV is usually parked, but all they find are a couple of tumbleweeds blowing past the old digs. No one really knows where Peggy Jo goes for the next few months, but when the FBI gets a call in October that a soft-spoken older-looking cowboy has just robbed a bank in a town called Tyler, Texas, they would later put it together that Cowboy Bob had indeed begun to ride again. They report to the authorities that the man's voice is feminine and his mustache looks fake. Now, Detective Steve is well into his retirement by this point, if only he could have known that his old nemesis was back. But this is a newer generation of detectives and they've only ever heard of legends of Cowboy Bob, so they didn't put two and two together. Peggy Jo is spotted across Texas in her RV for the next few months and often makes calls to her family and friends from payphones telling them she's happy and doing well. But in 2005, Peggy dons her black cowboy hat, large sunglasses, and this time some lipstick and blush, and heads back to the same bank she'd robbed the year before. Cowboy Peg walks into the bank and up to the young teller. She puts the satchel on the counter and politely tells the woman that this is a robbery and to not set off any alarms. The teller gives the cowboy $11,000 from her drawer, but she secretly hides 
hides a hidden dye pack that Cowboy fails to notice. As soon as she gets out the door, the dye pack explodes, covering her in red ink, ironically leaving her red-handed. Some FBI agents and cops who just so happened to be patrolling the area got the call and flew to the bank. After some regular civilians had spotted the cloud of red smoke coming from the man, they figure out they're witnessing a bank robbery and start to chase him. So here comes Peggy Jo screeching down the highway in her vintage RV with purple curtains, followed by the volunteer vigilantes, the police, state troopers, and the FBI. This is literally one of the best stories I've ever heard. But when the giant RV can't grind up to the speed limit as it climbs a tall hill, she attempts to make a sharp turn into a suburban neighborhood to lose them. The cops eventually box her in and surround her so she parks the RV and waits. Silence falls as dozens of officers in bulletproof vests surround the RV in the quiet middle class neighborhood, weapons drawn. The officers have no idea who their dangerous criminal inside could be and also consider that there could be a team of violent gangsters hiding out in the back. Minutes begin to pass as the standoff of the century takes place, with dozens of armed men pointing their weapons at this rinky-dink little RV in the middle of a suburban neighborhood. No one knows what went through Peggy Jo's mind as she sat at her tiny kitchen table smoking her cigarette while the men screamed at her to come out with her hands up. Maybe she looks at a box of family photos besides her now useless stained money and realizes her gig is up. Maybe she knows she'll spend what would probably be the rest of her life behind bars without the sun on her face and wants to go out on her own terms. Or maybe she just wants to go out like a true cowboy would. Peggy walks to the back of her bedroom where she kept a loaded 357 Magnum. Instead of grabbing that, she reaches for a toy pistol and walks to the door. The police officers cannot believe their eyes when they see a small elderly woman in a wide-brimmed hat who is older than most of their own grandmas answer the door. She steps out and tells them that they're going to have to fire at her. They beg with her, it doesn't have to be this way, but Peggy Jo, who wants to go out like a true outlaw, raises the toy pistol calmly at the mint. Four men open fire and Peggy Jo goes down. Hey, at least she went out in style. You can't blame her for that. Still assuming her accomplices are in the RV, the SWAT team throws tear gas through the window and raids it. But son of a gun, all they find in there is a neatly made bed, some glass dolphin figurines, Peggy Jo Talis' driver's license, and $38 in cash in her purse. All of that money, and Peggy probably gave most of it away like a regular old Robin Hood. When retired agent Steve Powell gets the call that his old nemesis had finally bit the dust, he's absolutely heartbroken. He's begun to think of Cowboy Bob as an old friend and now spends his time volunteering to give speeches about bank robbers to local bank employees. At the end of every seminar, he passes around a picture of Cowboy Bob and tells her story with a glimmer in his eye, almost as if he's talking about his first love. And that is the better than fiction story of Cowboy Bob, Peggy Jo Talis. I seriously cannot believe I had never heard this story before. Or how has there never been a movie made of her life yet? To think she stole all that money and never really spent it on much of anything besides taking care of others. You gotta admire her for that.